Girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. It's good to have you back today. We're, we're back to kind of a, I think what will be a regular schedule actually for a while now, which is one to, to two, maybe two live streams a week. We're usually gonna publish one Boca Podcast episode a week on the, on the audio side. And of course, if you're a Spotify subscriber or user, you get both the audio and the video. And I should mention that more often, actually. I, we're one of the few, if maybe the only photography podcast uh, on Spotify with video right now. So take advantage of that. These live streams go to video and uh, you can have kind of best of both worlds. The way the Spotify works, at least on my phone, is you can be watching the video and then if you need to focus on whatever is at hand, you can X out of that and still listen to the audio. It's kind of a cool deal. So take advantage of that. Just a little side note, but um, we will continue to push one to two episodes out a week on the live stream and then one episode a week on audio. And for those of you that are live streaming with us today, thank you. I'm excited to have you here and please don't be shy. Join in the conversation, ask questions, comment, send us funny emojis. Uh, we're getting into actually a really compelling conversation. Um, and I'll, I'll, of course, I'm going to introduce our guest here in just a second, but I'm, I'm really excited about this today and super practical for everybody. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, for those of you that are listening to the audio version of this after that, come join us in the live streams. Follow us at Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H Podcast on Instagram, and um, you can keep up to date with the upcoming live stream schedule. And then one other quick note before I introduce our guest for today, as I normally would, just want to encourage you all to look for opportunities to give back. I normally pop up a receipt on the screen today, but I made my donation to Charity Water before the episode. And um, I would just encourage everybody to look for those opportunities. One of our guests, Sean uh, Lee, actually was on the show a number of years, well, not even years ago, probably maybe a year, year and a half ago, and really pushed me in this regard. I think we should look for opportunities much like Sean does to look for opportunities in our community, national organizations, international organizations to give back. So let's look for those opportunities and give back as we can. All right, enough of the intro. Let's bring in our brand new guest for today. Heather, Heather Chesky is here with me. Heather, thank you so much for coming to hang out with me, have this conversation, a compelling conversation at that. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Well, and you know, we, we don't really know each other a whole lot. So this is kind of a cool opportunity in that I get to know you along with our audience. And uh, I appreciate you being willing to come just kind of take a chance, jump in, have a conversation. And yeah. uh, we're going to actually be talking about how to book clients in the span of a 30 minute phone call. And uh, again, I'm super like genuinely interested. I don't actively photograph anymore, but this is really compelling. And I think there's a lot here for me to learn as well as our listeners. So we'll get to that in just a second. But as a way to kind of introduce you, your brand, let's talk a little bit about brand position. Um, what are you doing professionally right now? And what is your business's brand position? Great question. Uh, I would say the biggest thing uh, that I've done, not initially in my business, because initially I got this all out of whack, but just really having my priorities in order. I believe to the core that uh, in order to be successful in business and in life and in relationships, we need to have like our faith first, then our family second, and then business uh, as a third. And so I think just getting those priorities in line really helps um, just to really maximize all of our relationships in business and also in personal life. Okay, cool. So that that kind of sets a, a baseline for you as far as how you approach life and business. What sets? Now, I, I know that we were we were chatting for a few minutes before we got started today. You are primarily focused on education for the sake mm -hmm. of photographers. You're still photographing a little bit. You said continuing to work with existing clients. Um, yes. I guess that you've developed over the last ten years. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. But then your main focus is education for yes. the photography community. Tell us what that business's brand position is. What sets that apart from some of the other education that's out there? That's a great question. So a lot of my story, um, a quick cliff note version is, you know, 10 years ago, I was working a steady day job. I had a baby at home and I lost my job completely unexpectedly on a Wednesday afternoon or excuse me, a Wednesday morning. And I had to replace my income. There was no wiggle room in our finances at the time. And so basically photography was a hobby. I was like, okay, like I got to make this work and I want to make it work in such a way where I could 
could be present in the life of my child and then children. And so I, I, a lot of my position in my business and also in the education that I do is really building a profitable business that allows you to be a husband or a wife who's present and then also present in the life of your children. So obviously blessing your kids and you know your, your client and providing a great service, but then also not doing it for free <laughs> and really making sure your family gets a return. I believe like, you know, every time I leave the fam or leave the house, I need to be bringing something back home for my family to pour into them. So I feel like for me, I'm very adamant and I teach this a lot in my, with my students is just growing a profitable business that allows you to have that time and financial freedom to where you don't have to photograph, you know, 40 sessions a month at a hundred dollars a pop just to make ends meet. Sure. That makes sense. Well, and I can actually jump to your, your website here real quick. And so for anybody listening in, make sure you go to Heather. Actually, the I think that the official URL is the booked photographer. You can also go to heatherchesky.com. Um, Chesky is spelled C-H-E-S-K-Y.com. But there on your site, it says, hi, I'm Heather and I help photographers get booked. And I mean, that in and of itself is a pretty simple and clear brand position statement. That is your focus. And you added kind of an <laughs> yeah. addendum to that in, in the conversation just now, which is you help photographers get booked for the sake of creating freedom yes. in their lives, for the sake of the, the important relationships in their lives. And I think that's, of course, a, a super important uh, part of Absolutely. that. But I appreciate you kind of explaining that. And let's, let's actually just jump from that question then to a question about customer experience. We're going to come mm -hmm. back to time management, especially as it relates to family in a second. But from your experience, both as a photographer and then working with photographers as well, what would you say is the biggest principle or idea driving the customer experience that you provide for your customers? Yes, great question as well. For me personally, I have made it a goal for so many years now. It's like I want to be the person who answers the questions before they're even asked. So back when I was photographing a whole lot of weddings and seniors and families, it was just like I want to make sure I provide all the information they need in a timely manner and also remind them because people forget so that they just don't ever have a question in the process. They know what to expect when they are prepared, they are ready, which also leads into, you know, having the calls that we're going to be talking about in a moment, but just basically providing that information for them so they can make the best possible decision and also be confident in their decision. So proactive communication and expectations Correct. management. It seems like kind yes. of how to best sum that up. And that's super important. It's, it's been a point of conversation here on the podcast a lot. And I'm glad for that. You know, it's, it's funny. Sometimes things can seem or, or concepts, ideas can seem a bit repetitive. Are you familiar with um, Gary Vaynerchuk, for example? Yes, I am. Yeah. So if you follow his content for any period of time, even for like a week, you're going to hear him say a lot of the same things over and over again. And I think some people get kind of annoyed at that. And what I, I've actually realized the value in that over the years, especially as a business owner and a marketer myself, that sometimes in life, in fact, actually a lot of times in life, there's that 80, 20 principle at play, right? It's, it's yes. the 20% of the ideas that do 80% of the heavy lifting. And so the idea of repeating some principles or concepts is actually, I think a really great thing because it's easy to yeah. be like, oh yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. And then go about our lives or our businesses and not actually apply it. Sometimes it, right. it bears repeating a few times and then, and then the light bulbs come on and we're like, oh yeah, I guess I should go do that thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. It is so true. <laughs> well, let's, let's jump on then on that note to, um, and we're going to actually kind of come back to that conversation about family and business time management, right? Um, I have yes. two kids myself and it, I mean, as far as being, having the opportunity, the freedom, the flexibility to connect with them, that was really and has been one of the driving factors as an entrepreneur for me. I want yeah. to have the freedom, the flexibility to if I want to drop my work and go do something with them in the middle of the day, in the middle right. of the week and have that time to ultimately dedicate to the relationship with them. So when it comes to running a business and finding some version of, of your balance um, between yeah. work and family life, what does that look like for you? And, and I guess more specifically, again, what is the big idea that drives that ability? Yes, this is a great question again as well. Um, and I, I want to like share just a 
teeny tiny story of when I really learned this lesson and really found out, how, okay, how do I have balance? How do I actually maximize on the time that I'm giving? Many, many years ago, my husband was actually got said some chronic health issues. And so he was on disability for quite a few years. And that meant that he literally couldn't even get out of bed, couldn't even drive. And at that point in time, we had two children. And that was just a, such a difficult season where I had no balance whatsoever because yeah. I was doing the job of two parents and also taking care of an ailing husband. And then I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old and also a business that was financially responsible for everything. And it was just insane. I spent many days crying, but it was in that season that I began to ask myself this question that I've just always come back to. And the question is, what is the one thing that I can do right now that will have the biggest impact in my business? And oftentimes in that season, and you know, life can be crazy even now. So even now I would only have like 15 minutes or 20 minutes to work in my business. And so I would ask myself that, Hey, what's the one thing I can do right now yep. that will have the biggest return in my, in my business. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, that answer would change depending on the season and depending what was happening. And so I would focus in on that one thing, really prioritize um, the most important task and let go of the rest because I'm not superwoman. I can't do everything. And so that question really just helped me prioritize, prioritize everything uh, in my life. I love that. It, so. Back to that 80-20 principle again, right? The 20% the yes. doing 80% of the work. And it's so true on so many levels. And we could literally spend two, three hours talking just about this, um, I'm sure, between yes. the two of us. I guess one important question that comes to mind, though, is you're describing this approach to work and, and balance mm -hmm. in life how do you decide what the most important thing is? Because, yeah. you know, if, if we look at our, at our days as business owners and as individuals, part of a family or any type of relationship, there's just a lot on the list, right? So then, yeah. then it's a question of what actually does the, the heaviest lifting makes the biggest difference, has the biggest yes. impact, the biggest leverage. And I'm curious how you make that decision. Yes, I am personally a fan of doing fewer things really, really well versus a whole lot of things half ass. <laughs> so I've always looked at, okay, like what do I currently have in front of me? Yeah. Who are the clients that I currently have or the current inquiries? How can I maximize that relationship? And so I've just wanted to always be faithful with, with what's already been given to me rather than go chase after something that I don't have yet, trying mm. all the, you know, marketing hacks or twicks or trends. Um, and and really just kind of spinning my wheels versus just, okay, I have X, Y, Z, let me focus on building those to the best of my ability. And then as time allows, as my energy level, I can bring on something else. That's good. Yeah, that's actually, yeah. it is so tempting with all the options out there for us to yes. go to the next thing. Sometimes we do it, whether consciously or subconsciously, as a distraction from what actually needs to be done or is right. the most Shiny important object thing. syndrome is, is a 100%. real thing. A hundred percent. And by the way, I'm guilty of it too, so I understand. Yes. Um, but you're absolutely right. A lot of times it is focusing on what we got here right now and, and doing that well and doing it consistently that can make the mm -hmm. biggest difference and the payoff right. comes from that. So that's that's a great reminder. Okay, so time management, one of the, the I guess the ideas, principles that, that helps most effectively with time management is the idea of delegation. With photographers, yes. I would say still speaking of that 80-20, outsourcing editing can be certainly one of those things. I'm not biased at Absolutely. all, I promise. <laughs> um, but, but in addition to that, there's you know delegating say administrative tasks like email management yes. and bookings, um, delegating accounting work, album design. I mean, there's quite a bit of a, a list that we can come up with. Mm -hmm. Is this a concept, a principle of you've experimented with in your businesses? A hundred percent. Earlier this year, I actually hired on my first full-time employee. So that's been something. And I've had like other contract workers throughout the year. So that's always been a part of the process. But I made that big jump in hiring out somebody full-time just, what was it, six months ago. And that's just been so valuable, valuable because it really allows me to focus on the things that I really enjoy doing in my business the things that I'm best suited to, um, to, to do and things that just light me up. And then my, my employee can handle all the other odds and ends of things that, you know, need to get done, but I don't necessarily care about doing, but yeah. I can't ignore them completely. Yeah. And, and the other, maybe something that you've kind of experimented with is not just the things that you like or dislike using that as a point of reference to make a decision about what to delegate, but then also the things that don't require you to be yes. involved too, right? Absolutely, that's huge, yeah. 
And I think it's just learning how to replace yourself in little mm. areas that don't necessarily take your unique stand or your unique input mm -hmm. um, and replace it with somebody who can do the job just as well and perhaps even quicker. Well, and what's funny about that, I mean, it's amusing, but I think there's some practicality to it too. Like 2022, at least American culture anyway, like we're treating ourselves all like unique butterflies. And yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly there are elements of us that are unique, but I think we also like put so much significance and weight on how important and unique we are that we then lose sight of the opportunity to be able to delegate something, which yes. by the way, could, most of what we could do, what we do can be handled by somebody else. And, and I think learning to kind of give up the little bit of the ego involved in that conversation and the means control. that we have, and the control associated with that, yes. absolutely gives us the opportunity then to be able to grow and scale our business and to do exactly sure. what you've been doing. Uh, a little side note question about this, actually, I'm curious. So you, you hired your first full-time employee, you've mm -hmm. worked with contractors previously. Mm -hmm. Communication to me, at least from my experience anyway, is, is the biggest, um, I guess, complicating factor in the process of learning to delegate, right? Because yes. I mean, something like editing or email management, both of those yeah. things re we're, we're talking about our voice, right? A reflection of our brand. And mm -hmm. cer certainly there are other elements of our business that are similar. So we're trying to communicate something that we want to somebody else that doesn't necessarily even communicate the same way that we do. So words don't even necessarily mean the same thing, right? But we want them to do this thing in a way that mirrors us, that mirrors our brand. And that's a challenge because what I've found, I've been guilty of it and I've seen from other photographers at Photographer's Edit is photographers a lot of times will say, do this thing, but they don't give the instructions or the detailed <laughs> instructions along with it. They just kind of assume yep. subconsciously that we're gonna figure out what yes. they think. And yeah. that just creates a nightmare of a scenario, right? So yeah. how have you learned to more effectively communicate for the sake yeah. of good delegation? Yes. So what I do with my person is every Monday, we actually have a video Zoom meet. So we're in constant uh, communication. Um, we go over the big task for that week, what he's responsible for, my expectations for him. And then also on top of that, every single day, like I, we use, um, we actually use Asana, which is a mm -hmm. great management system just mm -hmm. to, you know, delegate things and have, um, you know, the to-do items. And so every morning um, before his shift starts, I send him a link list of what I expect for him to get done. At the end of the day, he sends me a list back saying what he got done, any you know issues he ran into, um, those kind of things. But it's so funny that you mentioned this because um, I've been working with him now for six months and he's wonderful. But in the initial months, I had to learn how to communicate where I would just send him a task to do. He would do it. And I'm like, well, this is not what I wanted. Like, <laughs> this, yep. is, this is crap. Like I could have done it in like half the time. Now we're going to have to go back through and yes. do everything all over again. And so it was really frustrating for me, but then I had to take a look. I'm like, okay, you know what? I never actually explained the process for him. And actually, honestly, English is his second language too. So that is another barrier to having the communication. Sure. So I've learned like anything new that I do, I'm going to record a video a tutorial first, walking him through the whole process. And that's something that he can rewatch or if like it's a task that, you know, maybe only needs to get done every couple of weeks, he could go back and rewatch it if he needs to like just, you know, refresh his memory. So that, those are the things that have helped us. That's interesting. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's funny. You talk about working with somebody who has English as a second language. Mm -hmm. I grew up overseas um, in business as an entrepreneur. I've worked with those overseas quite a bit, actually. So when you add that additional factor into the process of delegation, mm -hmm. man, it, it's, it further complicates it. But yes. it also, I think, sets us up as entrepreneurs to do what I think is super helpful when it comes to learning how to communicate more effectively, which is to communicate like you're speaking to a fifth grader or a sixth grader. Yes. And it's not about yes. intelligence. It's just about language, something that can yes. potentially get lost in translation. I mean, this happens with English speaking people, those who speak yes. English as their, their primary language, but then it can also, it will certainly happen with those that, that don't. And so learning how to communicate something in such a simple way that even a fifth or sixth grader can understand it, then of course translates to, to somebody who, yes. who is not speaking English as a primary language. Right. Um, and it further kind of emphasizes the skill set that we need to develop, which is to learn to communicate simply. So that, that's an interesting challenge that you've um, learned to, yeah. I guess, process and deal with. 
Yeah. And I mean, I actually used to live overseas myself. So I was the one who was just like, nobody gets me. I don't understand anything. And <laughs> yep. I felt like alone. Like, I mean, there was one instance where I was in an overseas place and I'm just like, I, there's no other English speakers around here. This is crazy. And I was that way for a solid few weeks. And it was just really hard for me. Um, but then also too, I just understand the importance of being able to communicate. And then also too, it's like right now we're in the process of building out an entire library of video to tutorials. So whenever we add on to our team or if for some reason he moves on to another thing, we already have that system built, um, which I think is really helpful too. Okay. That's, that's good. And yeah, you're right. I mean, I have endless videos backed up in Dropbox as point of reference and I'll, I can send those videos to various members of our team. Um, it is nice to have that to go back to. I, I'm, a, I'm a big, uh, a little bit of a nerd when it comes to record keeping, because I always want to be able to point back to a conversation, whether it's a text message, Slack message, video meeting, whatever it is. Right. Um, and I think it's actually a smart way to go, especially when you start working with more and more people to be able to go back to reference something. So yeah, a little extra tip for everybody listening in. Let's keep going though. And, and actually, by the way, for anybody listening in um, who, I, I know I kind of alluded to Photographer's Edit in passing, but photographersedit.com, if you're not outsourcing editing yet, go check it out. You can use the code BOCA podcast for 40% off your first order. Just throw that little uh, extra bonus out there for those of you that are not using Photographer's Edit yet. But last question before we get into the topic at hand, Favorite book, self-help book, business yeah. book um, that you would want to recommend to our listeners? Yes. Yeah, so this might catch you by surprise, um, but it's honestly the Bible. I believe like the Bible is like the greatest book on success ever written. And there are so many principles in there that I have just applied in my life and in my business that I have seen um, just work. Um, specifically, the book of Proverbs is really amazing. We were talking earlier about being faithful with what's mm. already in front of you. That's straight from the Bible. I could list off other principles and, you know, there's... Uh, there's also really other, you know, non-biblical great books as well. But I think a lot of them um, like stem from principles that are found in the Bible. So mm. that's one thing that I really enjoy that I always go back to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And Proverbs is rich with principles. I mean, that, that's yes. largely what that book centers around, <laughs> yeah. it, it seems. Yep. So. Um, that's really interesting. I don't even have to pull that one up on Amazon. I think anybody can find a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you do want to pull one up on Amazon, I'm also a fan of Profit First by uh, Mike Michalkowitz, I think is how you pronounce it. That's a book that I've actually read a couple of times. Every couple of months, I reread it just to make sure my business is um, is profitable because if you're not <laughs> profitable, if you're not making money, you really don't have much of a business. You just have an expensive hobby. So that's also something that I've been, um, a, a book that has made a big impact in my business as well. That's good. Yeah. An expensive hobby. That's something to keep in mind too. <laughs> and I did pull that yeah. up. I'll pull it back up on Amazon. Profit first, transform your business from a cash eating monster to a money making machine. And uh, we'll link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com as well. All right. So the primary topic at hand, Heather, we're going to talk about how we can develop a 30-minute phone call that will consistently convert a potential client to a paying client. And um, let's just start with kind of an introduction, if you will. Like how, well, first of all, have you always been a natural salesperson? I know it doesn't come naturally no. for me per se? No, okay. not at all. What's the backstory um, and there? And honestly, even to this day, I still get nervous and anxious. Um, but back when I first started, I would just get knots in my stomach. My face would turn all beet red. I would stutter over my words. Like this was definitely not something that I was born with the ability to do. And I think that's the thing too, where like um, we can learn anything, anything, especially in business is just a skill set that yep. if we just practice it, we yep. become better at it. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Okay. So I'm curious, and maybe you're going to touch on this. When I think about difficulty in sales, I think one of the biggest difficulties that uh, I've faced trying to be a salesperson is when I'm selling something that doesn't come naturally to speak about. That was not a very well phrased yeah. sentence, but I think you get where I'm going with that. So for, for example, photographers edit, I started Photographer's Edit because of the concept that we were talking about earlier, time. I wanted more freedom, more flexibility in my life, especially for the sake of relationships. And so Photographer's Edit was born. And the cool thing is that also benefits photographer, other photographers in the same way. It gives them more freedom, more flexibility in their lives for the sake of relationships and doing things that actually grow their business. So it's natural for me to talk about it because it comes from a very personal and deep place. I don't have to try to sell it. I can speak from right. personal experience. 
so it flows more naturally. It's those instances where I'm trying to sell something that I either don't know very well and or doesn't come from personal experience that seems to kind of complicate right. things a little bit. Has that been your experience as well? So, and we'll get into this as well. I think one of the things, if it's hard for you to sell it, then maybe you don't necessarily believe in it or um, you're talking to somebody who you're trying to push it on and you haven't yet taken the time to really learn about them or their needs first. And you're trying to be more of that sleazy uh, salesman, which what we're going to go into today okay. is not about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to jump past that process. Okay, cool. So we'll get to that. And that's actually a really interesting mm -hmm. distinction. Uh, but the two points that you made, knowing what it is that you're selling and then two, also knowing the person that you're selling to so that you can kind of sell in context, if you will, of who yes. that person is. That's really cool. So where yes. did you end up learning these sales techniques? Did you end up reading a bunch of books, yeah. listening to speakers? Like how did you go about that? Yes. So it was a lot of trial and error uh, initially. And then also... <laughs> I, I also really like to hire my own photographers for like my son's newborn photos when they were born and then also family photography for, throughout the year. So I think it's super important to put ourselves in the client's shoes, not just simply trade with another photographer, but actually be paying clients mm. because we can learn so much about the process yeah. of being that paying client. And so I've done that quite a bit and I've had some really great experiences and then some experiences that were like, oh man, like I need to change this in my experience because I did not like being on the receiving end of, of that. So that was also a portion of it. And then also um, one of my very first business coaches um, also really helped me uh, finesse this strategy as well. Okay, cool. So before we get to practical application, what this actually looks like, what this phone call looks like, how it breaks down, there's a, a, a kind of a pain point for our industry. And I, I was talking to you about this a little bit before we got started. It's come up quite a bit on the podcast as well. And that is introversion. Um, mm -hmm. And it plays into the apprehensions that I think a lot of photographers have, even when it comes to just the general idea of sales. The idea of talking to somebody that we don't know, that we're not familiar with, um, going into groups of people or otherwise. There's, there's just a certain level of apprehension that a lot of photographers have because they're self-professed introversion or introverted yeah. individuals. So yeah. to that end, I'm curious uh, if you would be willing to share a few pointers, if you will, that will enable photographers to kind of move beyond those introverted tendencies to be able right. to handle this call more effectively. Sure. Uh, so just overall, I think the things that make you the uncomfortable the most are likely the things that you need to be doing the most often in your business. Yeah. So if getting on the phone and talking to a, a potential client is really outside of your comfort zone, use that as a GPS of like, okay, that's my next area of growth. That's when I can mm. experience this next up level in my business. So I think the uncomfortableness is a good indicator of the thing that you need to be working on. Um, but aside from that, um, there are three ways that I think we can approach the conversation on the phone with more, um, just better prepared for it. And the first one is actually just the, the preparation and leading up to it. So I actually use a system called Calendly. It's just a, a, where an appointment calendar where people can just oh, schedule Calendly, a yeah. time to yeah, they could yeah. talk to me. It's not the only system out there, but I really like using that because within that system, I mean, I can actually um, dedicate, you know, the certain days and times that I want to talk to a client. So they're not going to schedule a call at like eight o'clock at night because that's not going to be available for them. But then also on that um, scheduling page, I can also get more information about them. So I'm not going into the call blindly. Um, and then also with using a service like Calendly, you can uh, auto schedule emails. And so like reminder emails, prep emails. And so that also lays the foundation so that they're prepared for the call as and like they're coming into it with a little bit more knowledge as well. So that would be the first point is just actually being prepared, prepared. and having all the ducks in a row. Yeah. Um, the second thing I would say is just practicing. Uh, we mentioned earlier that like anything, you, you can learn anything. It's just all a skill set, but you learn it by actually practicing. So I would have these conversations. I would practice them by myself. I would practice asking the question. I would practice with a friend or with a spouse. So like I would actually have these conversations, not just like mentally going through my head, but actually get used to the words coming out of my mouth so that when I was on the phone with a client, it just flowed that much more easily. Um, and then are the you, third thing, before you oh, get to ahead. the third thing, I have to ask, are you, I'm a total nerd and this is what I do. I actually, I'll practice before a presentation or a conversation yes. that I need to have with a client, a friend, a family yes. member. I will actually do it out like I'm driving in the car and I'm having this conversation yes. out loud just to practice yes. 
I think about the words, how I approach it. I have a tendency of yeah. talking too much, so trying to refine it down as well. Do you yes. do that kind of thing? I do. I absolutely okay. do. When I, it's so funny. Um, when I started photographing high school seniors way back in the day, and I was really learning like the the posing and the process for that, I would literally stand in my bath, like in front of my bathroom mirror, and I would practice the poses yeah. myself with me, like <laughs> looking at my reflection, yeah. and like that just got me comfortable with directing my clients. So mm. I think there's just so much benefit in the practice portion. Okay, cool. So take, we got prepare, practice, and what's the third step? Yeah, the third step is actually having a chat map, which are the steps that we're going to go into on today's call, but literally actually having something written out that you can refer to when you're actually on a call with somebody. And like that just prevents you from being like, oh, like my mind went blank. Like, what do I say here? But actually having, okay, like step one or question one, question two, question three, you can, and not that you actually have to hold to it like tooth and nail, but at least it gives you a flow of where to go, what the end goal of the conversation actually is. Yeah, that's in fact, you and I talked about this before we started the podcast yeah. today. And I, I've mentioned this before, but for everybody listening in to kind of break the fourth wall, I'll send an outline of talking points and questions mm -hmm. to my guests before they come on the show. And what I explained to Heather was it's not meant to force that conversation to be robotic. It's just to right. give direction and flow ultimately to to the conversation. And of course, that makes it a lot easier for the, the end listener as well. Right. So yes. that, that's a really great point. And going into even something like a phone call, having a plan, a direction to go mm -hmm. really can make that conversation easier or better, I would say more effective, but also easier for yes. the photographer who's apprehensive because they're like, oh, I don't know this person. I don't know what's, yeah. what's going to happen. You yes. can actually plan for yeah. it in that way. That's good. Okay, exactly. cool. So let's then, let's just jump into the meat of it. Let's talk about the, the primary steps. I think you mentioned there were five um, primary steps or, or ideas that drive this 30 minute call. Take it away. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and say the five steps first, and then like we can, um, you know, park ourselves at each step if you'd yeah, like to. That's great. The first step is to basically introduce yourself and establish the boundaries. Um, you want to take the lead in this conversation, not let your potential client just ramble on for 30 minutes. Uh, the second step is to actually ask insightful questions to learn more about them, what they're looking for, their experience, their end goal with the photos. Um, the third step is to actually reaffirm, like basically repeat back what you heard the, your, your potential clients say, and then also, like tie that in with the photography service, the wedding collection, your uh, portrait collections, how th that can help them with what they said they wanted. Um, the fourth step is to basically make your offer, that's your pitch portion. Um, and then the fifth step is to invite them to be your client and to, for them to actually pay on the phone. So many photographers forget asking for payment and they'll just send an invoice later and that might lose the sale because people get busy. But the fifth step is to you know, invite them officially to be your client and then also with that, you're getting their payment information over the phone. So that's the overview of it. <laughs> Okay, cool. So let's go back, like you said, step by step through each of these. You talked about the yes. first is an introduction and an establishment of, you know, I was writing so fast that I can't read the last word that I wrote down. So what was that? What was <laughs> um, that point? Yeah, now? a boundary, like just basically Boundaries. you're establishing yes. the boundary. Okay, okay so, so I'll yeah, go ahead. I was just okay. going to say, I'm, I'm curious about what that means, because I don't think I've ever heard yes. a sales conversation frame this way, but I, I like I like the idea of structure. So what does that mean to establish yes. boundaries? So for me personally, I'll just go ahead and like read off what I typically say. I'll just say something like, hey, it's Heather. Thank you so much for reaching out to me about, you know, whatever they reached out to me. We have about 30 minutes together. So I'm establishing a time boundary. And basically I'll say like, I'm just going to ask mm. you a couple of questions and just feel free to share whatever is on your mind. So I think that time boundary is really important because I mean, I got kids. I have a life. I don't want to be on the phone for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, two hours. Um, you know, I want to make sure it's the most effective it can be. But it creates a sense of urgency as well. Like you're creating yes. limitations. So there's some urgency built into that. Which yes. Is good. And I think also too, um, your potential client would also appreciate because when you're thinking about like, you know, you're going into a sales conversation, like your, your potential client, they're, they're smart people. Like they know they're going to be sold to, and they don't want to sit there for hours being like, okay, they're going to push this on me. They're going to push that on me. And so they don't want to 
feel sold to. So I tell yep. them, hey, we have 30 minutes, okay? And we're not gonna go longer. I'm not mean with this at all. Like if That's they're still pop, like talking, I'm not gonna like hang up on them. Yeah. But you know, I'm establishing that boundary so they also know what to expect. And this is also in my prep emails as well. Um, so it's just reiterating that process because you know, honestly, not every client reads every email either. So <laughs> you're just reiterating it. Yes, yeah, there's, yes. that. Yes, I'll, I'll stop there. It's so tempting to go there because that's a conversation that it's not just applicable for clients, but photographers as well. There's so yes. much noise that we're taking in all the time, but we do have to keep that in mind because in order to, I guess, maximize, especially in the context of sales, maximize the effectiveness of the call, we have right. to minimize the noise, right? So right. I, I love the idea that you're not only creating the limitations, boundaries for the sake of your own benefit, but it also kind of eases the mind of, of the client too. They they know right. that they, you're not gonna or they're not gonna have to listen to you drone on for an hour about <laughs> what you exactly. think they should do. That's, that's actually really <laughs> exactly. cool. Exactly. Okay, so then exactly. step two is ask insightful questions. Yes. And I mean, I guess to play a little bit of devil's advocate, it's it's commonplace for photographers to talk about quote unquote developing a relationship mm -hmm. with their clients. But to me, a lot of the times those efforts seem very kind of surface level. How do we actually go beyond that and ask, and when you say insightful, yeah. I, I would consider those maybe even deep questions that kind of go below yes. that surface level. What does that look like? Yeah. So the first question that I really like to ask is just asking them what inspired them to reach out to me and even schedule the call in the first place. So this is more of like a market research question where I'm like, I want to know what of my marketing strategies they saw or that they heard about, or, you know, if it was a past client who shared the experience with them and that's how they heard about me. Like, I want to know how did they actually hear about me and then what inspired them to reach out. And I think that also plays into like, Hey, they're the one who scheduled this with me like uh they're the ones who reached out so like i in that case like i have full permission to share what what i'm going to be sharing mm. and so like I, I just it's just honestly it's helpful for me to know what of my marketing strategies is working um you know and then also too like if they are were referred by a past client i also like to you know send my past clients to refer me out special gifts so like that's also helping the overall experience that i offer Okay, cool. So you, you kind of established the baseline, which is where did you come from? Like, how did you hear yes. about me? That's the yes. first insightful question. But then what is it? Where does it go from that? When again, yes. thinking about insightful questions? Yeah. So basically, I guess it starts more surface level. Um, but basically, I'm just, hey, so tell me about, you know, your wedding or tell me about your, your high school senior daughter who you need a portraits floor or tell me about your family. So it's just kind of like that base level question of whatever they're reaching out to you for. Just tell me more about that. It's an open ended question. They're going to share more about their daughter or their fiance or the wedding they have planned. And then I, one of the things like if I get stuck, I always like to say like, oh, so tell me more about that <laughs> because then it's just like it helps me get my bearings and kind of think of the next question to ask. Okay. Um, but beyond that, it's just like, okay, so why are portraits of, you know, your family so important to you right now? Why have you waited, you know, five years, 10 years to actually hire a professional photographer? So those kind of questions where you kind of get under, under it. And then also, I mean, carrying on, like, when you ask these questions, it's also making sure they have time to answer them. Um, another really great question that I like to answer or ask is like, you know, do you have any reservations about being photographed? Yeah. I know for myself that like, I don't like being in front of the camera. In fact, yeah. this e-cam is like up on my screen, but I have it shifted over. So I don't see myself <laughs> because I would be too distracted. And yeah. so I am not a fan of seeing myself on camera. And so I know my clients won't be um, a, like most of them, not all all of them. Most of them won't be a fan of that either. And so I just like to know like, Hey, what kind of reservations do you have about being photographed? You know, are there any sort of, um, you know, just things that I need to be aware of. And that just helps me provide a better service for them. Okay. So, so you've, you've collected this information and then you're moving on to step three here on my notes, the, the reaffirmation or even the yes. repetition of the conversation thus far. And is that more just to confirm the understanding, the details of this potential job that, yeah, that they're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so there's one more distinction that I wanna make um, with the asking question part. This is more for the photographers who offer products and do IPS. This is like a really important question to ask as well. So I'm also adamant about getting, hey, what is their end goal with the photos? I don't want them just to get the, personally, like I, I do products, for, like I don't, do, I offer products to my clients. A lot of my clients, you know, get gorgeous albums, wall art, the whole nine yards. And so I wanna know from 
from the beginning what are the products that they are actually interested in. So I will even say like, hey, after like, you know, your wedding day has passed, how do you want to remember the images from that day? Like when you walk in your, uh, you know, apartment after, you know, a hard day's work, what do you want to see on the walls? What do you want to see, you know, on the coffee table? So I'm having them describe how they want to see and experience those portraits after everything is said and done. And this will help me tie back into the products that I offer mm. them. Yeah, that so. sets you up for the sale later on. Exactly. Okay, that <laughs> exactly. totally makes sense. And then and then to that reaffirmation process, you're just kind of repeating it back to them so you're sure that you heard them clearly? Yes, yeah. So then basically the reaffirmation is like if they shared anything that they were concerned about, perfect example would be, you know, high school seniors, they're in... Um, they have hormones going on, they might break out. So like they might say like, hey, like I'm very self-conscious about my skin. I, you know, I still break out, I have acne. And that gives me an opportunity to say, hey, I totally understand um, that happens in this age group. That's totally normal. We actually partner with a professional hair and makeup artist and her sole job that day is to get you looking and feeling the most beautiful you've ever been um, and really just accentuate the features you love about yourself and hide the ones that you're not a fan of. So again, like basically I'm tying it back into what I offer in my experience that addresses the concern that they have. Okay, that's really good. And it speaks for itself. So let me jump to the yes. next point then, making the offer. And again, yes. this is where we all kind of clinch up and get nervous and we're like, oh shoot, now I have to ask them yeah. to buy my thing. What does that look like from your perspective? Yes. So what I have done, and this is how I teach it in my program, is actually for to create some sort of a, a web page or a PDF, some sort of a document that you can send your potential client while you're on the phone with him. Now, this is not something that they see beforehand. Um, we want to make sure we're guiding them through this process. So I actually have, um, and, and it can be anything. So basically, I would send them a PDF or I would send them the, um, you know, the, the specific link. I would say like, hey, are you next to your computer right now? I would love to send you our collection information and then we can walk through it together and you can ask any questions you have. So then basically I will send them that web link, that PDF, whatever, I'll go through each and every point. And when I'm going through those points and like, let's just say I'm getting to the point about, Hey, the, you know, the, here's some sample canvases I offer. I can tie it back to like, you know, you already mentioned that you would love to have, you know, this portrait in this little nook in your house, um, you know, of your senior son, this option might be really good for, for that. So I'm not saying like you have to do it. I'm just saying this might be something to consider. This might be a good option for that. If they mentioned they wanted an album, of course I have like little uh, photo of an album on there so I can reference whatever they said they wanted on the collections that I offer. So that's how we kind of like tie it back to like what that. they already said. Yep. Yeah. And well, and, and I guess you've really kind of summed it up beautifully at this point, but I'm, I'm just thinking of how that would ease the conversation. I guess you, you even said this earlier for the photographer who's nervous about selling something, yeah. they're able to kind of ease that discomfort by knowing the client. And, and they've done that now by asking a lot of detailed questions. Yes. They have context. So they're selling based on that context. It's not just this kind of general, you know, buy my service. It's right. They're actually and saying, think, hey, based on you said this, this and this. And I think actually this option and this option work really well because it meets the needs that you were. So that, that makes a lot said. of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times and this was definitely me in the early years, people can be, be so apprehensive about sales because they feel it, it's so pushy and like you're shoving your stuff on somebody who doesn't really want it. But if we can reframe this entire conversation like, hey, tell me what you want and then I'm just going to show you how what I offer fits what you want. <laughs> Brilliant. And, and it's simple and, and it's simple. Like there's sometimes we say something as simple as easy, but there's actually a lot involved. Yet, but like that's yeah. really straightforward. I, it I, is. I really love that. <laughs> OK, so so then we get to number five, which is to invite them to actually pay for that service while they're on yes. the phone. Again, yeah. photographers, probably myself included, kind of clinch up a little bit like, oh, shoot, like I'm going to have to actually ask them to pay for this thing. <laughs> how, yes. how do they do that with a little bit more ease of mind? Yes. So what I'll say, and I, I'm only going to say this, I'm only going to share this with them if I truly think that they're a good fit. If they're not a good fit, then you know we end the conversation earlier in the process. So I'm not trying to twist somebody's arm who I know instinctively is just not going to work. But if they are a good fit, I'll say something like, "Hey, like you know, I think you're they're the perfect bride, and that you love this collection. It's exactly what you've been looking for. What do you think?" So then I'll give them an opportunity to share what they think, to share what, and also it's so cool because when I ask 
ask the, hey, what do you think question, they'll go ahead and name off what they actually like about that collection or what they like about the experience, what they find most valuable. And that's actually really insightful for me to hear. Um, so that is the kind of like the question. And then, um, you know, sometimes they might have questions and we can talk about that in a moment. But if they're like, hey, I think this is great. This is exactly what I've been looking for. What I then say is like, awesome. Um, and you know, this is so exciting. In order to make this official, there's just two more things to do. The first one is the uh, agreement, which I'll go ahead and email you as soon as we get off the phone. The second one is just accepting the payment, which credit card or which card would you like to use? So I'm not not asking them if they want to pay right now. I'm just saying, which car do you want You're to assuming. use? assuming, yeah. Yep, I'm assuming a yes from the very start. Interesting, okay. So. Now, you mentioned in passing some, some follow-up questions that, that you might ask during that conversation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so sometimes they might have objections and that's totally okay. Objections are not a bad thing. It just means they might need a little bit more clarity. Um, you know, some common ones of like, oh, I need to talk to my fiance first or I need to talk to my husband first or it might be like, um, oh gosh, what are some other common objections? That's the one that I get most often. Um, what are some obje objections you get? <laughs> well, I, I think this is the thing. Like I don't have a ton of, of sales experience. Um, when, okay. when clients were coming to meet with me, it was usually that it was set up pretty well. Um, and then I wasn't trying to hard sell products to them after the fact. So I honestly, I'm a little bit of a rookie on this side yeah. too. In fact, we didn't even do IPS. We, we were using a gallery system when I was actively photographing mm -hmm. weddings. We were using a gallery system. We'd upload the images and then like clients could buy prints or they didn't have to like, and, and yeah. I regret doing that now. I wish I had been more proactive in sales. So this is this is a learning curve for me too. <laughs> yeah, so the the most common objections that I get are like, hey, they need to talk to somebody else first. Um, there have been on occasion, they have just more questions about the process or like the timing of everything. Um, you might occasionally get like, oh, it might be too expensive or I can't afford it kind of a question sure, as sure. well. That might be a common one. Um, but then, you know, and so like you can address each one of those. Um, for the, hey, like I need to talk to somebody else first. What I like to do is um, help my potential client like practice this conversation. So let's say I'm talking to a, um, a, a mom who wants to hire me for her daughter's senior photos and you know the husband is in charge of the finance and so she can't move forward without his you know approval kind of a thing and so he's at work so he's not around and so she'll just say hey like I just need to talk to my husband first and I say hey that's totally cool do you feel like you have enough information to share with him and so that helps me to know like do I need to share anything else with her is she mm. confident with it and then I'll ask her I'm like okay so how are you going to bring this up to so and I use their names to it's very important to use names, but how are you going to share this with, you know, your husband? And that gives her a time to practice the pitch. I mean, I can't be there when she's pitching my services to her husband. So yeah. I want her to practice that conversation. Wow. Um, and then this is the really important part. Like if they're not ready to move forward at that particular moment, that's fine. But I would like to always book in another call. I will not leave it open ended. So I'll say like, oh yeah. And then I'll ask, um, so when do you think you can talk to your, you know, your husband about this and most of the time she'll say oh like tonight when he gets home from work I'll be like great is it okay if we you know schedule a quick follow-up call tomorrow at you know 9 30 and then you know she'll say yes or no we'll find a time and then I'll put that back into my calendar system so she again gets more <laughs> reminder emails and also yeah. I send out reminder text messages as well and then those emails have a lot of testimonials in them and so it kind of like preps for this and then also the two when you actually schedule in another call, you're not going to be left wondering and waiting what happened, um, which I think is just so important. I, I've heard from so many photographers, like they just hate, like they felt ghosted and like they never hear back from a client. And so even if it's a no, like I want to know it's a no. <laughs> so most of the time, like it's it's not a no. Like, I mean, I have a pretty solid pre-qualification process, so I'm not dealing with a lot of no's. But even if it were, like I'd want to know, like instead of just being like, okay, well, they just disappeared. Like I have no idea what happened. And then you start to question, maybe it was my pricing. Maybe I need to, you know, knock my, my prices down a little bit and discount because maybe I'm just not worth it. So yeah. you're actually scheduling that call. If, if the decision isn't made while you're on that mm -hmm. 30 minute call, then you're scheduling a second one. So you can at least have the conversation and there are no yes. questions left. Correct. I like that. That is correct. Yeah. That's super yeah. proactive. Okay. Well, cool. you know what? I, first of all, I have to give you major props, Heather, because like this has been extremely practical, extremely actionable. Yeah. And to my earlier point, 
not even that complicated either. It's just, no. it's simple ideas that we can go apply right now. So yes. I really can't thank you enough. I know that there's a lot more to sales though than just this, you know, 45 minute conversation that we've had here. So will you share just a little bit more? And you didn't even ask me to do this, but I'd love for you to share just because yeah. you're such a good teacher, a little bit more thank with you. our listeners about the additional education that you offer. Sure. Before we get into that, can I actually share one more bonus tip? Yeah, please, please, please. <laughs> that has made all the difference yeah. in in my conversation. So I don't necessarily do this with a whole lot of my portrait clients because they're you know paying a lower session fee, and then this bigger sales is later on with the products. But definitely for my wedding, and I also photograph brand clients, the the, the higher collection pricing. Um, one of the things that I have done that has been so instrumental is offering a booking day bonus, and this is so important because when I'm actually going through my collection with let's just say a bride and I'm getting to the very end I can say something like oh and you know you actually have the ability to if you want to move forward today you actually get this booking bonus and it's a really sweet deal um it's changed over time I um, mean it's all based on like your client so I'm just going to give you what worked really well for me and this might work for your listeners or it might not but the idea is to offer a um, is some sort of incentive for them to move forward quickly. Um, but for my bride specifically, I found that like the brides that I was connected to that were being like, you know, we just dived really well together. They were like best friends with their mom. Like they would be doing everything with their mom. Their mom was very active in their wedding planning process. And so I, my booking bonus was basically offering a parent album completely complimentary. I was willing to take on that cost um, because during the conversation, I was actually having these calls with the bride and her mom. It mm. wasn't the fiance, it was the bride and the mom. Yep, and yep. so when we went through the process and I was like, hey, the booking bonus, I was like, hey mom, that's actually for you because I know you're spending a lot of time, energy and effort into planning your daughter's wedding. And you know, she might be your only, like I would know by then if it was just, like the only daughter. And so this booking bonus is, ab is actually for you because I want you to actually have an album that you can remember and look back on and share that day and so that was such a game changer because mom was the one that held the uh card and so like when i actually like, had book a her, book gift, her. <laughs> yes when i actually had a gift for her that's when my like i was having brides pay in full after a 30 minute conversation and it was incredible um and of course that's not the only booking bonus you can do but just the idea of having a limited time bonus not to pressure them into anything but just to help them move forward quicker and like if it's a good fit they're going to get an added bonus and ideally the bonus is really going to serve them at you know a higher level okay yeah that's a great tip actually so yeah. i hope everybody if, if you weren't taking notes go back listen to the episode again take some notes because again yeah. very actionable practical information heather do share just a little bit about the additional education that you offer through your site as well Yes. So, I mean, a lot of the, all the information is basically at thebookedphotographer.com. So yeah, thank you for putting it up on the screen. We have a lot of free resources there. So you can basically, you know, click on whatever resource that best suits you. We have a free class, a free uh, crash course. We have a blog that is full of information and just like, if you prefer reading, um, you know, reading all of those tips. So uh, basically that is how you would get a hold of me. Um, we actually have also a 12 month mentorship program. If people want to go a little bit deeper, that's also on the website as well. So, um, yeah, everything's there. Well, perfect. I've put it all up here on the screen. So everybody make sure that you go check out the booked and then go follow Heather over at Heather Chesky on Instagram, H E A T H E R. And then C H E S K Y on Instagram. Of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But uh, Heather, thank you so much, truly, for making time for all of us, myself included today. Absolutely. It was really encouraging and exciting information. And um, everybody, enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation. Talk to awesome. you soon. Thanks for